seminar on uh, engineering leadership for the conceptual age. And on behalf of my uh, co-host, uh, Dean Nachman from the College of Business, I'm not sure if he's here today, but I know if we, we have a lot of the people here from the College of Business, we uh, welcome you here and glad to have you here uh, today. Uh, what we're doing today is continuing our conversation and on how UTEP can create the necessary leadership for the conceptual age. And the conceptual age, remember, is an age where we're heading into where value is created by the exploitation of ideas and concepts, replacing the more historical utilization of, of resources and, and manual labor. In this conceptual age, engineering graduates will need to know more about how business works, and business graduates will need to know more about how technology works. And following the announcement of the uh, $10 million gift from our alumnus, Mike Loya, uh, Dean Nachman and I and, and faculty from the two colleges have been working to develop a plan uh, to create opportunities for business and engineering students to learn together and then apply that learning in synergistic teams. Because we believe that graduates of these programs that we're developing across the two colleges that combine both business and engineering skills will be best equipped to lead us into that conceptual age. And our speaker today is, is apropos for that because his skills and what he has demonstrated over his career, a uh, very illustrious career, is from the combination of business and engineering uh, skills. Our, our speaker today is Dr. Jerry Porras. He began his professional journey with a BS degree right here electrical engineering from uh, Texas Western, so that dates him a little bit as to when that uh, degree uh, occurred. But after working for a few years as, as an engineer, he decided that he would be better equipped for this coming conceptual age if he got some uh, business skills as well, and so he went on to get an MBA at uh, Cornell. And after that, he decided what he really wanted to do was, was go into research, and he knew that a PhD was required for that, so he went on to get a PhD in, in uh, in behavioral science uh, from the business school at uh, UCLA. He's now been on the faculty at Stanford University's Graduate School of, Bu school of Business since 1972 in uh, emeritus status since 01. He has a large list of publications and has won numerous awards, and, and that's in the literature that you have. You can look at that for details. Uh, but he's had a very illustrious career in, in research and education there at, at Stanford. Uh, but he's probably best known for being co-author of, of two best-selling books. Uh, Built to Last, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies, and the follow-on book, Success Built to Last, Creating a Life That Matters. Today he's going to talk to us about why leadership matters and why building an organization with lasting impact is what we should all be striving to do if, if, if leaders is what it is that we want to be. So with that, help me welcome Dr. Jerry Forrest. As I look around and see the size of this crowd, uh, it's pretty clear to me what the power of a free lunch is. <laughs> as, as a faculty member and as associate dean for a while, I recognized that if I ever wanted to get a lot of faculty into a meeting, I'd offer them free food. And they're just like students, they show up in tremendous numbers when they get free food. I, uh, as you heard, I started out life as an engineer. Uh, an electrical engineer, and did that for a few years, and then decided that what I wanted to do was uh, really to be a manager and get a, uh, an MBA as, a, as an important part of that process. And in getting the MBA, a uh, funny thing happened to me on my way to uh, an MBA was that I discovered that I was really passionate uh, about people. And I was uh, in a conversation earlier this morning where I, where I described that when I graduated as an engineer, uh, I knew there were people around, but I didn't really know that they had things like feelings. <laughs> or that we didn't all perceive the world in exactly the way I perceived it. So it was quite a shock for me to learn uh, about those things, and I learned it in a course in uh, the business school called organizational behavior, uh, and I found that I was really passionate about learning more about people and 
how people behave uh, as individuals or in groups and how they behave in organizations. And that this was something that I wanted to uh, spend the rest of my life involved with. And that's how I made this transition out of engineering to uh, this field of human behavior and organizational behavior. Well, in doing that, I think I uh, uh, learned a lot of things along the way. And it, uh, what, what this invitation to give this presentation did for me is it, uh, is it forced me to reflect on, um, uh, on where I began and what I was missing as, a, as an engineering student and uh, as a young person involved in a highly technical field and what I really needed to, to have in order to, to make me a much more well-rounded and effective organizational member. And so that's, that's kind of what I'd like to, to talk about today and weave it in with, uh, with some ideas that have grown out of the research that I've been doing and uh, primarily the research that was driven by, it was driven in, in the, the study of, of these incredible companies that we report in the book Built to Last. Um, usually when I talk about things, I like to talk about research so that, that what I believe that I'm conveying to an audience is not my opinions about things, but my descriptions of research findings. And, and I feel a lot of confidence when I do that. In this presentation, I'm mixing it up. I'm talking a little bit about research and findings from research, but I'm also giving you a lot of just my opinions. And uh, I always wonder what they're worth. And since I'm not getting paid, getting paid for this talk, I, I understand what they're worth. <laughs> so, so that freed me up uh, to, to be uh, much more Broad, broad spread sort of in, in the types of ideas that I'd be willing to share with you. So a lot of these things that I'm going to be talking to you about are my opinions, and, and I'd love to discuss them with you uh, in, in, the, in the questioning period. I hope we have a question period. I'd love to discuss them with you and uh, get your views on some of my opinions. The question I ask myself is, well, what should the leaders of the 21st century look like? Um, because the world is changing and leadership has looked a certain way up to this point. Uh, it's constantly evolving and certainly like, like it's not a stop and start sort of situation, it's evolving and so leadership will look slightly different this year from what it did last year and so on. But if we think about, about a longer time period, you know, 100 years is 21st century, what, what do I think that leaders ought to, ought to be like uh, at, at the end of that period to, to really have been uh, effective individuals in leading organizations? There, there's, some, there's one word that I'd like to, uh, to, to emphasize here is the, is the idea of, of a great leader. Uh, there are a lot of leaders that are good leaders, uh, but I'm wanting to focus on, on the, the ones that are at the end of that distribution and that we could call really great leaders because there, I think, are few and far between, but I think there could be a lot more of them, and as I give you my point of view, I think you'll understand why I think there could be a lot more of them. Well, if we start out with the, uh, with the traditional view of what a great leader is like, uh, these are the sorts of words that are used to describe people that we think are great leaders today. And in fact, as you know, Steve Jobs uh, died recently. <laughs> and there were just numerous articles about him and what a great, fantastic leader he was. And if you looked at all the articles that were written about him, these are the sorts of words that would pop out in the descriptions of Steve Jobs. Now, when you look at this list and you ask yourself, do I see myself in this list? I know when I look at that list, and I think about myself in the morning as I'm looking in the mirror brushing my teeth, you know, I don't see someone that looks like this. Especially I don't see a charismatic leader looking back at me when I, uh, when I brush my teeth in the morning. 
Now, maybe some of you do. I'd ask you to stand up, but I'm afraid you would. <laughs> uh, you know, we tend to see maybe some of this, or a little bit of these ideas in us, but boy, at this level, we don't see it. And what this view says is that you cannot be a great leader unless you're like this. So what does that do? I think it sort of flushes 99% of us down the toilet. You know, we're not, we don't fit this. Very small number of people fit these descriptions. So from this perspective, we're all doomed not to be great leaders. We don't have a chance. And that's been the traditional view. Now there have been literally I think thousands of books written about leadership. I don't think that there's any topic that has been more widely covered in books than leadership. And all these books will convey some perspective on how you can become a great leader. And so each person that writes the book has some formula, or some view, some idea that'll make you into a great leader and make you into often what I'm calling this type of leader, a charismatic visionary leader. Those books are designed to help you sort of become this ideal, charismatic, visionary leader type. Well, as we look at, at history and we look at organizations, we do find examples where these types of leaders create great organizations. And when I say it, it, in, this, in this term, great organization, I'm, I'm talking about an organization that really performs very well by whatever traditional measures we have, and also makes a significant positive impact on the world in which it operates. This is, a, this is what I call a great organization. And these types of leaders do, at times, create these types of organizations. And Steve Jobs, in my opinion, uh, in creating Apple, uh, Apple is a great organization today. And I sort of mumbled that today which may be a very significant issue, as you will hear in a minute. <coughs> so these leaders create these great organizations, and they typically are great while the leader is there. So Apple has been great while Steve Jobs was there. In fact, if you look at Apple from its founding date forward, Apple and Wozniak started the company, but, uh, but not Apple. Jobs and Wozniak started Apple, and um, Jobs was kind of the sort of the external guy, and Wozniak was the technical guy. And they built this company, and it really started to take off. And if you look at the curves of performance and all of that stuff on the company, it was going like that. Then Steve Jobs uh, gets in a bit of a squabble with the board, and so he steps down as the uh, CEO, and he becomes the chief technical officer. I can't remember what the title was that he had. And then he leaves the company. And so Apple then looks like that. And he's gone for 12 years. Then Steve Jobs' successor gets fired, and Steve Jobs is called back, and what does Apple do? Looks like that, again. And it's been going like that since his death up until his death. So, you know, those of us who study organizations would call that a natural experiment. You've got this fantastic company, you pull out the CEO, what has happened to the company goes like that, put the CEO back in, what happens to the company goes like that. So supposedly, if you look at that experiment, of course it's a sample of one, but if you look at it, you'd say the CEO is really critical to the success of this company. And that sort of reinforces this point. So that these types of leaders, what we call great leaders, create great organizations. And they're great while they're there. And the question is, what happens after they're gone? Now, I call those types of organizations that continue to be great after the great leader is gone, I call those enduringly great organizations. Organizations that 100 years from now, Apple, if it is an enduring great organization, 
would be this outstanding, incredible organization that it is today. Okay. So those, those are distinctions that I think are important because they talk about the longer term versus the shorter term. And I think that this is one of the things that is going to need to be different in leadership uh, in this coming century is we need to think more and more about the longer term impact of organizations and whether they endure and they're great for longer terms rather than the short term quick, quick hit sort of, sort of company. Now in our study of Built to Last, we found that the leaders of those companies looked like this. Now when you look at this list, when I look at this list, I say, hey, that's a little bit more like me. I can identify myself more in a lot of these words than I could in the first set of words. And my hunch is that more are you, of you are saying the same thing. This is kind of more of the normal person, the kind of the everyday person that we, that we see in the mirror in the morning or around us. Now, these built to last leaders, in our study of them, uh, built organizations that endured for very long periods of time. Uh, we studied them for an average of 100 years, but some of the companies we studied were 200, about 200 years old. So these are different types of leaders, and they created and led and built different types of, of organizations. So when I put all of these ideas together, I came to the conclusion that what doesn't matter, doesn't matter, this is what I think doesn't matter in terms of leaders, it doesn't matter what your style is, it doesn't matter whether you're charismatic, autocratic, or participated, or all of these things don't really matter. They make a difference, but the difference are at the margins. They're not the fundamental difference between the charismatic visionary leader and the type of leader that we found in the Built to Last research. Because we found Built to Last leaders, leaders that were described with those other words, that were some of these things. So these things didn't seem to matter in, in determining uh, the effectiveness of a leader. So if these things don't matter, then the question is, can great leaders of the type that we found in the Built to Last study create great organizations in the coming century? So my view is that excuse me. does matter when we look at, at leadership and we look at the types of leaders uh, that I described as the charismatic visionaries and then we look at the types of leaders that we found in the Built to Last research, that what really matters, the fundamental difference, and this is the one thing I'd like for you to take away with you when you leave, is that what really matters is what you focus on as the leader. What is it that you focus on? What do you put your energy and effort and your time into? The charismatic visionary leaders focused on what I describe as leading their organization. Now what does that mean? They were the ones that provided a lot of the energy for the organization. They're the ones that provide the direction of where the organization is. They're the ones that provide the vision as to where the organization needs to go. They're the ones that provided the, some technical expertise in some situations. They were the ones that provided the strategic focus. They were the ones that made the key decisions about what products to go after and on and on. They were the ones that people in the organization looked to for the key decisions the organization needed to make in order to be successful. And once again, Steve Jobs is, is sort of the extreme case of that, where every single piece of, of the, the, the iPhone was okayed by him. 
in many cases was stimulated by him. He was the key factor, and he was leading that organization. But organizational members, organizational leaders, CEOs can lead in other ways besides that. What this type of a leader does, however, is that they provide the, the, the key decision making that's going to make the organization successful. That's what I call leading the organization, and the charismatic visionary leaders did that. That's what they focused their energy and effort on. In contrast, I believe that the 21st century leaders must focus their energy and effort on building their organization. Now, how is this different? What does it mean when I say building their organization? What I mean to say here is that the organization consists of a whole lot of components. And all of these components have to work together effectively to produce an outstanding product or service. Now, if you're going to build an organization to be able to do that, you've got to focus on all sorts of things. You've got to focus on creating uh, uh, the, the right structure. You've got to focus on creating the right culture, the right reward systems. You've got to focus on bringing in the right technologies and the right people to execute those technologies, and on and on and on. Organizations need to have a lot of different capabilities in order to be successful. A 21st century leader must focus on what those capabilities are and build them into the organization. That's where the energies and efforts of this individual need to go. Let me give you a, a very concrete example that we found in the Bill Philatz research. GE and Westinghouse were founded about the same time. GE is a very well-known name today. Westinghouse, some of you may not even know, it's still around. But it was, it was like GE for many, many years, up until the last probably 20. So GE and Westinghouse were found in the same time period. The leader of Westinghouse, George Westinghouse, was a famous inventor and had a lot of patents to his name. He founded Westinghouse and kept it going for the many years that he was the CEO around his inventions. Westinghouse needed to have great inventions in order to be successful, and he was providing them. He was that visionary leader. In contrast, General Electric was not founded by a great inventor. It was not founded by someone who was a, even an engineer. But what was clear was that that technical expertise needed to be in the company. So what this individual did is he created the very first industrial research laboratory. He built the organization. He built a research laboratory into the organization that was there and had the responsibility for creating the products that GE was going to sell and use for, for as a basis of its business. Westinghouse, the product came out of George Weston's house, Westinghouse's head. GE, the products came out of the industrial research laboratory. That's what I mean when I say building the organization. That's an example of it. What does the organization need to be successful? What capabilities does it need to be successful? Does it need to have great strategic uh, strategies? If so, let's bring in great strategic thinkers and put them into an organization that we call our strategy group. That's part of building an organization. Or we need to have uh, innovative behavior out of our employees. How do we do that? Would we create a culture in which innovation is really valued? We measure innovation and reward it in, in formal ways. We create uh, uh, job designs that allow employees to spend 15% of every work week just dreaming up new ideas and coming up with innovations. We have, we have a formal system for identifying the great innovators in our company, and we have big parties and bring them up and give them a trophy. All of these are ways that innovation gets stimulated in an organization, and these are different organizational interventions that are made to stimulate that. 
So that's what building the organization is all about. And, and the leaders of the 21st century need to focus on that building. Because that's what create, creates an enduring great organization. The leader does not have to be there in order for the organization to continue to be successful. When George Westinghouse left, Westinghouse didn't die, but it never performed at that same level as it had performed while George Westinghouse was there. When the GE CEO, and his name is escaping me right now, otherwise I tell you what it is, no, no, this was the CEO at the founding dates of, of General Electric. When, when he left, when he left uh, a GE, what happened to GE? Kept chucking along, kept getting better and better and better. And now, you know, we think of Jack Welch and GE, and they're both synonymous in terms of their tremendous successes. So GE is having a little bit of trouble right now, but they've had trouble in the past, and they've pulled out of it because they've had the capabilities in the organization to do the things necessary to be successful and to be great <coughs> over a long time period. So the organization is not dependent on the leader for its enduring success. The organization has in it the capabilities to be enduringly successful. This is a profound idea because people who build organizations tend not to be the flashy, charismatic, everybody recognizes type of individual. And if you're in the organization and not the top person, you tend not to get recognized as readily. You tend not to get the accolades. You tend not to get celebrated as much. And so, and so that, that sort of seductive power of being the charismatic visionary uh, can force a lot of people to want to move in that direction, especially if they've got some natural charisma in them. Whereas for the, for the individuals who go about building something, they don't get the accolades, they don't get the recognition as quickly. But over long term, their impact is seen, and they wind up getting promoted, but it's a longer term process longer term process and it's not sort of as loaded with as much uh, fanfare and accolades as, as the charismatic visionary is. So you got to believe that what you're doing is that you're building something that will uh, be uh, a legacy to you and that that's important to you. Now a question I ask myself as I, as I think about these charismatic visionaries and, and the long, longer term type of leader is uh, do, what do the charismatic visionary leaders really want? Do they want to leave a legacy? To make it, I bet if I ask them, they'd all say yes. But if I look at their behavior, they're not doing that. Because they essentially have, have built an organization that's dependent on them, and in a sense is crippled once they're gone. So if it's important to leave a legacy, the most effective way that, that that can be done is by focusing on, on building an organization. Now one final point on this. The question might pop into your mind, is it possible to be a charismatic visionary leader and also a leader who builds an organization? And uh, the answer as far as I can tell from the data that we looked at is yes. It is possible. But it's harder. It's a lot harder. And Sam Walton gave some great examples uh, in, in our research that we found from him. You know, he said, look, I know I'm, I'm a, Sam Walton founded Walmart. So Sam Walton said, he said, look, I know I'm charismatic. And he was charismatic kind of in a, in a down home, folksy kind of way. He drove an old pickup truck. and He was kind of a good old boy type of, of guy. But he was charismatic in that process. And so he said, I know I'm charismatic. And he said, if people come to me and they're asking me for what strategy should we follow, what products should we pull in, what kind of system should we put in our stores, they ask me these things and they want me to make the decision. Because they know how successful and effective I've been in what I've done all my life. He says, and it's really hard to push that back on them. To try to get them to figure out what the best strategy is or what the best system to select is. 
and to help them figure that out. But to put the responsibility on them, not take it from them. When I put it on them, they grow as managers. They grow in their own effectiveness. And when I'm no longer around, they'll continue to be successful and Walmart will continue to be successful and it's not dependent on me. So for those of you in the audience here who are charismatic, visionary types of people, if you want to build something that's enduring, it's going to last a really long time, it's a harder trip for you to follow. It's a harder path for you to follow. It's easier to kind of just be the charismatic visionary, give all the good decisions, you know, feel great about yourself, and then die and you don't care. <laughs> Tough, but possible. Well, with, with all of this as kind of a, a, a background and setting, setting the stage, well, actually, it's not setting the stage. I think this is one of the very main messages I want to deliver. Is that when you think of yourself as a leader, potential leader, think, you're, think about yourself as someone who needs to build something if you really want to create an enduring great organization. So my belief is that, that and this is kind of a self-serving statement, um, I'm sorry, this is the endurance part of my, of, of my comment, but my belief is that uh, really engineers with the proper training and education are very well positioned to build enduringly great organizations. And I, and I speak about this really from the experience of having uh, an undergraduate education as an engineer, working as an engineer for a while, and then moving into the business and the organization side and seeing the two and working with individuals who, who come from an engineering background. I think, I think we really have uh, the basic, many of the basic sorts of, of orientations and viewing problems and learning how to problem solve and so on that are very important for, for an effective uh, leader. So if, if this is true, then uh, what's needed? What's needed in the academic development uh, of a future engineer? Because it also, as I look back at my own history, I recognize that there were some dramatic holes in my development as an engineer to become a leader and a manager type of person. There were some dramatic holes in it. So as I thought about those holes, and now this is, this is speaking very personally and in, in, in my own opinion about this, I decided that what was needed was really several, several areas. It was really uh, sort of a lot of things, but, but uh, organized into several areas. So let me give you what I think these areas are. First of all, I think what's needed is that engineers, and I'm speaking mainly the engineering population, I know there are a lot of business folks, uh, especially students in the audience, but from the, the, the uh, engineering perspective, and maybe also from a lot of the business student perspective, is that you really need to understand why people behave the way they do. Everybody is not like us. Everybody's not like me. Everybody doesn't think about the world like I do. And that's a true statement for each one of you. And so you need to have a better understanding of why people behave the way they do as individuals? Why do people do the things that they do as individuals? Why do they behave the way they do in groups? Because that's a whole different dynamic from the way individuals behave with each other. How groups behave with each other, because that creates a different dynamic, a whole lot of different ways that groups behave when they are interacting with other groups. And why people behave the way they do in organizations? What are all the forces that are acting on individuals and organizations? And how do those forces result in behavior that they may have uh, later on? So understanding behavior of people is a really key thing. When I graduated as, a, as an undergrad, um, like I said earlier, I, I, I understood very little about human behavior. I understood very little about how people responded to certain incentives and don't respond to others. I understood very little about 
uh, the types of motivations that people might have and how they might interpret the world differently from the way I was interpreting it. We were seeing the same thing. And you know, we look at the same elephant, and I'm describing it one way, and they're describing it another way. I understood very little of that. You know, I thought everybody was rational, and you get presented the data, and you know, you look at the data, and you do some analysis, and you come up with the same conclusions. It's pretty straightforward. And hey, the world doesn't work that way when we're dealing with people. So this, in my mind, is in a lot of ways the very biggest hole that I think I have. And and those of you who are who are students. Uh, may well need to examine yourself in this arena and ask yourself, well, how skilled am, am I in this arena? And what are some areas of, of growth that I need to, to think about developing for myself in this arena? For those of you who are engineers, you really need to have more knowledge about how business works, about things like economics and finance and accounting and strategy and marketing and the human resources and entrepreneurship. These are all very, very uh, powerful factors in organizations because these things have to go on in order for the organization to be successful. And I know when I started working as an engineer at GE and, and at Lockheed before then, um, I didn't know any of these things. You know, I didn't know anything about a balance sheet. And, uh, and I began to realize as I watched managers how much more they knew about these things than I did, and I just kind of had this sort of technical side to me, but it was really this side that to a large degree made the technical side successful. So without this, the technical side couldn't function effectively because the resources wouldn't be brought in to allow the technical stuff to go on. So you need to understand about these things, and, and, and I think this is an important addition to what's needed for, for engineering students to become great 21st century leaders. I also think that you need to have really a greater and stronger set of personal behavioral skills. You need to be able to build much more effective interpersonal relationships. So much of leading is an interpersonal relationship. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. It's dealing with an individual. It's building uh, 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 trust and, and confidence in the relationship so that you can trust that the other individual will do what they commit to and they can trust that you'll do the same. And that you'll provide each other with the information they need to do the job and they'll provide you with information about how they're doing the job. It, it, that's all rooted in, a, in effective interpersonal relationships. And without these, it's very, very difficult to be an effective. You need to learn more about how to deliver effective, communicate effectively in a verbal way. So you need to be able to make presentations to more than one person. You need to be able to speak effectively in groups in, large, in, in larger organizations. There's much larger organizations in a group. Written communication, some of the stuff, I mean, I, some of the stuff that I used to write as, as an engineer and I go back and look at it, I think, oh my God, not very effective. A lot of communication is done, is done in written form, especially with the internet today. Um, I think a lot of written communication has suffered because of the internet, because we're trying to make things more concise and briefer, and as a result, we often miscommunicate, or we communicate the wrong message. We may communicate the right idea, but we communicate the wrong message because of the way we write it. I think we, that we all need, we all need, not just engineers, but we all need more skill in written communication. I think we need more ability to be empathetic, to understand more clearly where the other person is at. And it's so easy for people to get into leadership positions in which they totally lose empathy with what it's like to be the person that's being led. And as a result of that, a lot of the behavior that we see in leaders is very ineffective. Connected to this, we need to be sensitive to the other's needs. As part of being an effective leader is having that. And then finally, I think an important behavioral skill is to be more and more and increasingly authentic. 
And what I mean by that is really being the person that you are, not putting on a facade and trying to be somebody that you're really not. The facades get found out sooner or later. So if someone's interacting with you long <coughs> enough, they find that the, 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 the sort of way you're presenting yourself isn't the real you. And often this comes up in crisis situations where critical decisions need to be made and they need to be made fast. Who you really are starts to come out in those, in those situations. So understanding who you are and living who you are, I think is a very, very effective way for being, uh, to be a, a successful leader. And then fourthly, I think you need to see the world from eyes that go beyond the analytical engineering based view of the world. Or in the, or in the, in, in the business school, in terms of the business school faculty or, or students, and you're seeing the world as being you know, an analytical problem. And you get some numbers and you crunch those numbers and you kind of understand what's going on. I think that, that uh, you need to have other perspectives to help you understand the world. And for me, this is one of the biggest things that was missing in my engineering uh, training and education was what are those perspectives that can help me understand the world better? Think about problems differently. Philosophical perspectives, sociological, anthropological, political science, historical. These are all areas that are part of a liberal arts education. But when you talk to a sociologist, and you, he, and you sort of hear and see how they interpret phenomena in the world, at least I found that very often it was very different from what I was seeing in the world. Because they're coming from a different framework, a different paradigm, a different sense of what's important, and therefore they see the world differently. Now, is their world accurate, their worldview accurate, and mine inaccurate? No, I think we both see parts of the world accurately. But that means we're missing also parts of the, of the way the world works. And the way we can see the world more comprehensively is by being able to have these other lenses that we use to see the world. And, and I think that this is often, these areas are missing uh, in, both, in both business school training and education and the same for an engineer. <coughs> When, when, I, when I conduct a case study analysis with a group of MBAs, I find that the engineers sort of take the, the facts in the case as givens, and then they try to, to generate some numbers associated with those, and they go through a very straightforward, step-by-step -step analytical process to come up with a conclusion. The sociology majors think more about the broader dynamics of large groups of people working together and, and how we can affect that. The psychologists think about each individual and what the individual's needs are and what their ambitions are and what they're trying to accomplish. And so they all sort of analyze the case differently. Now who's right? They're all right. So the more any one individual can think about the world in these different ways, I think the more effective you can be as a problem solver and as a leader. So I would advocate the addition of these sorts of experiences and, and exposures to these ideas, these topics, as part of an effective developmental effort for uh, a successful 21st century leader. And then finally, what I think is needed is a strong technical in education, and once again, this is focused specifically on engineers, because that's what I, where I was starting with my thinking. But I think uh, you need education and, and a lot of knowledge of mathematics, and you typically get it. Physics, I think information technology is, is an arena that the future is going to be loaded with, and you need to know a lot about it. Clearly, data analysis is, is always a part of, of what I think you need to understand. And then, of course, your engineering specialty. You need to understand that. Now, when I put all this together, when I put all this together, this is an enormous amount of stuff. You say, how can I cram all of this stuff into a four-year curriculum? For those of you who are faculty members or, 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 or uh, 
associate deans or deans say, God, how am I going to cram all of this into a four-year curriculum? And the answer to me is, I don't know how you're going to do it. <laughs> I just think it needs to be done in some way, and four-year curriculum may be a constraint that has to be <coughs> softened, has to be loosened. You need to think about more than a four-year curriculum. And I know that in some of the planning and engineering school, there, there is a, a, an effort and, and a lot of thought given to expanding that. And this would give more opportunity to, to be able to, to approach all of these arenas that I've been talking about. But my, but my view is that, that, that the individuals with a with technical basis uh, really have a dramatic potential for being the most effective and successful leaders of the future and high level leaders. And I think that these ideas would really add to their confidence. Because as we get more and more technologically based, people who understand technologies and are comfortable with technologies will rise to the top. And if they're not also effective leaders by having some of these other things, uh, we'll have more disasters than we should have. So in summary, I think that, uh, that the, really the great 21st century leaders need to think of themselves as organizational architects. You, you're architecting an organization, creating parts of the organization, the human part, formal structural part, the technological part, physical settings. You're creating all of those with ideas in mind about how you're going to accomplish your collective purpose. And that thinking of yourself as an architect will really push you to focus on this building process. And I think it'll free you up to not believe that you have to be charismatic or you have to be this or you have to be that in order to be a successful leader. My view is that you can be a successful leader by focusing on yourself as an architect. One final idea, and that's the, this idea of values and leadership. And I'm throwing this in because I think that these are two ideas, two values that I that I'd like to emphasize, that I think unfortunately are missing in too many of our leaders. And I believe that, that the most effective and successful uh, leaders in the future will have these values as part of who they are. And I think that in effect will make them more successful as leaders. And the first one is, is uh, respect. Respect. Respect for people. Respect for the organization. <clears throat> a respect for competitors, respect for the society, respect across the board. That if we respect the process that we're in, the process of doing business, of competing with other organizations, if we respect that, I think we will make wiser decisions. <clears throat> I have a friend who started an organization uh, that focuses on helping people who coach youth teams, athletic teams, to help them be more effective and successful coaches. And it's called the Positive Coaching Alliance. And one of the tenets of the Positive Coaching Alliance is teaching the, the children that you're coaching how to respect the game. <clears throat> the game that they're playing, whether it's football or basketball or soccer, that respecting the game really allows you to behave in ways that are sportsmanlike, in ways that are positive, in ways that are more uh, successful from the point of view of the team. And I think that, that this idea of respecting the game, we ask ourselves, what's the game in business? Well, it's doing business. That's the game, and respecting that. But that's a powerful value that too many of our business leaders have forgotten. And the second value, <coughs> is the value of compassion. I think this is also <clears throat> a value that is not, is not prominent in many of our most prominent leaders. And one, and one that seems to be getting lost, <clears throat> excuse me, one that seems to be getting lost, at least in our political arena today, that, <clears throat> that very little compassion exists because if people were compassionate for others, I think the decisions that are being made 
by both business and government leaders today would look a lot different. And I think in terms of the longer term, in terms of this next century, I think we need more compassion in our decision making and more compassion in our leaders as a whole. So this is my view of what I think 21st century leaders would look like, should look like. Uh, this is a view that's based on, on starting out as an engineer with the sort of engineering education and training and what some of those changes are that I think uh, if we're able to implement them, and I can see that and hopefully see that uh, UTEP will be one of the leaders in that regard, but I think we will create much more successful and effective long-term enduring and great organizations. Thank you. Well, I think when I use the term organization, and I think these ideas uh, are applicable to uh, a, a, a company, if you will, of any size, whether it's a brand new company that you're starting up, uh, or it's a gigantic general electric. Uh, in fact, that, that idea or that conclusion is supported by research. That's not just an opinion of mine. In that, in that when we study the, the companies that we study, uh, we studied them from their founding day forward, and we found that these company uh, leaders were using these ideas from the very beginning. They were seeing themselves as builders of great companies, that they wanted to make a significant contribution to the world that went beyond just making money. So I, I think from a point of view of, of a company as an organization, from small, very small, to very large, these notions apply, and the notion of building, I think, applies across the board. From the point of view of an organization uh, such as a, 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 a government, so if we're looking at our political leaders, <coughs> then I think this issue of longer-term thinking, really longer-term thinking, um, of not being charismatic, those sorts of ideas tend to, to need to be sought. Because our political leaders, as an example, need to get elected. And, and one of the key skills in getting elected is being charismatic. So if you're low-key and you're soft-spoken and you're humble and all of that, you tend not to get elected. You tend to get branded as wishy-washy and, you know, oh, a lot of labels can be attached to you. So I'm not sure that these ideas would, would apply as strongly to a political situations as they do to business situations. If we're talking about nonprofits, I think these ideas apply from small nonprofits to large nonprofits. Um, so we've got government, educational systems, I think they apply to, to educational organizations. Uh, healthcare systems, I think they apply to healthcare systems. A lot of ways are very difficult to challenge uh, and change, but, but I think that they apply. So the place I put the caveat. Is in, uh, is in political organizations and political leaders. It's difficult to think in 20, 30 year horizons if you're a political leader because your uh, term of office is four years or two years and you might not get reelected. So, uh, you know, those leaders tend not to think in, in those ways and they, they tend not to think about building the long term. Although, interestingly enough, I think if you go back to the founding dates of this country, and, and look at, at the documents that were generated by the leaders who created this country, who created the Constitution, and, and look and see what's in the Constitution, and you start to see that there are core values that are there, and core values are part of what you build into an organization. And so they were building a lot of these things at the beginning, but it seems like our current leaders don't do the same thing. Thanks for coming again, giving us uh, your time freely. I hope we get to eat lunch. Um, what are 
some of the characteristics that you see that most of our engineers possess that lend themselves well to being leaders? <clears throat> well, I think that, that the, uh, the orientation toward paying attention to detail is important. Uh, the orientation toward gathering data and using data as a basis for decision making, I think that that's extremely important. I think the application of frameworks uh, that are rooted in, in, in either logic or in research and applying those to making decisions, I think that that's, that that's really important. Um, I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the notion of trying to create something uh, tangible, something that you can often see or feel, uh, that, that, that that's an important thing. It's not sort of just operating in your head. Uh, it's not something that's esoteric. It's something that's really concrete. I think that that's an important characteristic of engineering. Um, I, I think that, that it, it, it can also be a negative, but the fact that, you're, that engineers tend to be rational, <laughs> I think that that's a positive, but sometimes it's a negative because we don't sort of take into account irrational things. And we tend to discount irrationality. So when my son says something to me and I say, that's irrational, you know, I'm not going to pay attention to you. Well, that's not the smart reaction on my part. So uh, I think all of those are attributes that engineers and leaders, leaders, uh, great leaders, can have that will help them be more successful.